Kokon goes through this daily ritual in the early morning, seven days a week. I look after my rickshaw. It's my work tool. If it's not properly maintained, I'm a bad worker. It's what feeds me. His old rickshaw weighs 90 kilos, but according to Kokon, riding it isn't the most tiring aspect. Getting around the streets of Dakar, the capital, means the rickshaw driver needs nerves of steel. Hey, move along a bit. In the streets of Dakar, there are millions of cars. You need a sharp rein to react quickly. You must think one step ahead to avoid accidents. Be careful. Crossing the city is not the easiest for passengers either. 15 million people live here. 43,000 inhabitants per square kilometer, the heaviest concentration of humanity on the planet. Look, there's a traffic jam down there. I'm going to take a detour to get by. In Dhaka, you must never ever let yourself get stuck. Or you'll suffer the consequences immediately. The capital's become too small for its population. The street can no longer handle the volume of traffic. It's not unusual to be stuck between four and six hours, bumper to bumper. Kokon and his client soon find themselves trapped. In a rickshaw, you know when you leave, but you'll never know when you'll arrive. Most of the time, I leave hours in advance to avoid arriving late for work. You never know what you'll come across, a big traffic jam or even a small one. How can you live like this without ever being sure? Come on, get out of my way. Kokon spends five hours a day, seven days a week on his rickshaw without protest. He cannot afford to complain. He pedals for three euros a day. It's enough to survive on. This is the worst job in the world. Transporting passengers and their baggage by cycling. It's work that animals should be doing. If you want to work, you have to accept the good and especially the bad. His troubles are by no means over. In a few days, a massive wave of six million people will descend on Dakar and invade the streets of the city. Every year, the capital, Bangladesh, plays host to Ijema, the largest Muslim pilgrimage in the world after Mecca. But the country's infrastructure is very run down and not able to properly handle the millions of pilgrims. The trains are taken by storm. Move! Come on, get out of it! The greatest risk comes from when we go under bridges. You have to be really careful. Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world. One child in eight is forced to work to help his family. You need to be cunning to earn a potato. Crafty to catch a fish. And be ready to suffer to find some gold. Far from the chaos of Dakar, a handful of men are preparing for a difficult journey. <laughs> Safiq, the Imam of the village of Mungonj, is accompanying his congregation on the Ijima pilgrimage. <laughs> Allah 
90% of the country is Muslim, and a train has been especially hired for the event. It's the final moments of calm before the chaos begins. Food supplies, pots, and pans, blankets, the group has enough to keep them going for five days. One hour before departure, Safiq, the Imam, checks that nothing has been forgotten. Take care, you need to tighten that up properly. We need to bring everything with us for the Ichema pilgrimage. Water, oil, and fruits. Everything that we can. We try to bring as much food as possible, because once we're in Dakar, in the pilgrimage, there are so many people that it's difficult to get to the shops, and it's almost impossible to move around. The majority of pilgrims are very poor. Many have saved each penny for two or three months to be able to make the journey. It's a real sacrifice. Is everything loaded? Let's bring what's left on board. Come on. We know the trip will be very hard, especially today with this train. There will be so many people. This will not be a normal journey and especially for those that won't have a seat. Safiq can smile. He reserved their places months earlier. As for the rest, it's a matter of first come, first serve. Move along, this is my place. Have you found your seat? Well, sit down. You, come here. Seat number six is free. Oh, this looks good. I think there will be plenty of people this year. Well, you'll just have to sit wherever you can find a place. Is this the train for the pilgrimage? Is this the one? Hundreds of people have crowded onto the platform. It's a race for the last seats available. And to get one, it's each man for himself. I was very lucky to get a seat in this packed train. Well, so many people will have to stand for the whole journey. For some, that means six hours. Despite the crush, the joy of being part of the pilgrimage lifts everyone's spirits. Salam alaikum, my uncle, and have a great pilgrimage. To everybody's surprise, the train leaves on time, which catches some underwear. Is this carriage 27? These are fish for my, my mistress. Do you want to climb in? You can't. It's too late. Dakar is only 200 kilometers away. But in Bangladesh, no one can guarantee what time the train will arrive, as the journey holds plenty of surprises. Oh, that's a good start. <laughs> I'm happy. The train stops at about 15 stations, but that's not including any unexpected stops. Safiq, the Imam, is praying with Doha, a member of his community. It's Doha's third pilgrimage. Well, now it's fine. Uh, we're at the start of the trip, and there are still some places. But the further we go, the more people there will be, and the more crowded the train will become. All Bangladesh's dream on going on Ichema 
But the journey is so hard that for the old and the sick, it's impossible. Even rich people give up because of the difficulties. The trains are uncomfortable and drafty and date from the British colonial period. They've hardly been modernized since. These trains have been used since 1917. Of course, the country has developed. There used to be steam engines and then diesel locomotives like this one. But the carriages have not changed at all. One day, they announced that we would have new, more modern express trains. The people went mad with joy. Everyone said, we'd be able to get to our destinations far more quickly. It'll be fantastic. The seats will be much more comfortable. Uh, but when we saw the new trains, we were so disappointed. They're as bad as they ever were, except now they're even more expensive. It's best to have brought your own food for the journey as getting to the restaurant car is quite a challenge. But tormented by hunger, Doha decides to try it. Move your leg, please. To get something to eat, you need to push. Can you move up? Oh, what a mess. See what we have to go through? Excuse me. Nobody complains, though, because going by road in Bangladesh is far more dangerous. Oh, my God. In Bangladesh, you have to ride on top of each other to get to where you want. Sometimes people even sit in the toilets. If you need to urinate, you just have to dirty your clothes. The unexpected stop provides Doha with some relief. This is good, as I don't want to go to the restaurant car anymore. There's no way through. Right, I'm going back to my seat. The thousands of pilgrims, however, are a godsend to the young sellers of vegetable snacks waiting on the platform. Most are orphans, and some have been working from as young as five years old. Hot samosas. Five tacos each. How many do you like? My name's Atiku. My father's a rickshaw driver. My mother's dead. I have two young brothers and a sister. The tide of passengers is unending, and getting on board a carriage is now almost impossible. The overspill finds its way onto the carriage roof. The roof is barely two meters wide and slightly rounded, not to mention slippery. Woe betide those who doze off as the jolting of the train can hurl them over the side. Well, usually you're not allowed to climb on the roof. We do it as there's no more room below. The greatest danger is going under bridges. You have to be very careful then. Get down, get down. 
My wife died a few days ago. She wasn't paying attention and was hit by a bridge. She was killed outright. Just how many passengers are killed every year is unknown, but even the most experienced can be caught by surprise. Sit down. The young salesmen earn a living by risking their own lives every day. Asham has been dodging death since the age of 10. I'm not an amateur. I hang on tight. The first time I climbed on top, I was petrified. I couldn't get down, and I cried. A man came and carried me on his shoulders. And from then on, I practiced getting on and off. Now I've taken to the roof like a fish to water. See how I walk? It's OK, no need to move. I can get by, no problem. I can get to one wagon, to another too, see? Those that are just starting are scared. You mustn't think about it too much. If you stop to think, you're dead. You mustn't think of your parents or wife who'll cry if you're killed. If fear wins, then you're dead. I lived over there, so I need to go now. Bye. He leaps off the train, which is going at about 30 kilometers an hour. There's still a long way to go, although no one's quite sure when the train will arrive in the capital. In Dhaka, the life expectancy of rickshaw drivers and others who pull carts through the streets seldom extends beyond 40 years of age. Accidents, pollution, and physical wear and tear take a heavy toll. After three hours, Kokon can pedal no longer. He rests at the back of the rickshaw garage for free in exchange for some basic guard duties. I sleep in this corner. This is my blanket. The mosquito net. And my clothes. The money I save on rent, I send home. I have a wife and two children to feed. Of course, this work is very difficult. It's still better than having to force this sort of misery on my family. Poor people like me, who live with their family, are suffering very much. Misery leads to family ruin. Come, I'll show you the slums. Then you'll understand. In Bangladesh, there are millions of people who don't even have a roof over their heads. Thousands of rickshaw drivers live in the slums or in the streets. I don't want to. I refuse. I'd rather not live with my family. Those that earn enough can afford a home for their families. The others live like rats. I have refused to make my family suffer through that. Kokon's sacrifices means his two children can attend school. They're lucky as education rarely comes from the slums. It's resourcefulness that has to be found at an early age. 
This small band has become skilled at stealing vegetables from the market. Three and a half million people are crammed into Dhaka's numerous shanty towns. In his slave-like existence, Kokon allows himself the small luxury of telephoning his family in their village. He sees them just once every two months. Give me the phone, please. How are you and the kids? I'll be home in a few days, Friday or Saturday. As soon as my daughter's old enough to marry, I'll give up the rickshaw. I'll open a small shop, otherwise my daughter's life will be ruined. No one wants a rickshaw driver as a father-in-law. It's too miserable. It's embarrassing. And in the meanwhile, in order to pay for my daughter's dowry, I have to keep peddling. Without a dowry, Kokon has no hope of marrying off his daughter, especially as traditionally it's paid in gold. The goldsmith's neighborhood is Tanti Bazaar, in the old part of Dakar. Not much has changed here since the 18th century. Three thousand people work here, melting and fashioning gold. The workshops close when the muezzin makes the day's last call to prayers. Three shadows slip discreetly through the streets of the gold district at about nine in the evening. Give me the stick. Once a month, Ghazi and his two employees search through the sewers. These are the waste waters from the goldsmiths. The workshops are just behind, and their pipes empty out here. Thousands of litres of human waste end up down the opening to the sewer. When they work the gold, there's always some dust that flies off. And when they go to the toilet, it goes down into the sewers. Now, if we can collect that gold dust, it will earn us enough to eat. Shall we empty all the water? Of course. It's a process that will take all night. If we worked in the day, people would complain because of the smell. The smell doesn't bother me anymore. Gold has to be earned, and to find it means diving down. Specks of gold are mixed with human excrement. Now I'll squash down all the mud in one pile below my feet. And once it's packed together, I'll put it in the bucket. For the first few years, Shahalom felt nauseous, but now no longer even complains. I do this because it's all I know. Unfortunately, it's all I can do. But at least I can eat. With the crisis, however, less gold jewellery is being produced, and there's far less gold dust in the sewers. In the past, there were more of us prospectors. There were at least 150 people. But with less money to be made, they've given up. 
Nowadays, there's maybe about 50 of us. The water's cold this time of year. I first rinse off in, in freezing water and then finish my work and then take a hot shower. Ten hours work to fill two buckets with mud, which then needs to be sifted. Now I'm filtering this to remove any lighter earth. All that'll be left is the heavier substances. <laughs> Ghazi has been a gold hunter for 30 years. He first plunged into the sewers at age 14. I learned from the experts. I didn't like it at the start. Digging around in all this shit, I thought it was dirty. It upset me. But they slowly persuaded me, and after a few months, my shame disappeared, and I got used to this work. I still can't see any gold, but I feel there is some. There's one more stage. It's a delicate operation, and it's uncertain if there'll be enough gold to pay all three of them. Four hours and a dozen stops into the journey, the train, which is transporting Safiq the Imam and his pilgrims, is making slow progress towards Dakar. The old locomotive doesn't date back to colonial times like the carriages, but it's hardly modern either. Mohammed, the driver, is focused. In Bangladesh, the railways aren't protected, and people have the habit of using them as a road. Oh, look at those people on the rails. They can cause accidents. I'm blowing the horn to make them move off. Despite the crowds, Mohammed pushes the old diesel engine to the limit. And the monster manages 60 kilometers an hour, almost blindly. I can't see much through these dirty windows. It's a problem, as I can't even see the signals. And there used to be windscreen wipers. But they've been removed. And a speedometer would be good too. But we don't have one. And an emergency brake would be helpful. But we don't have that either. If someone crosses in front, what can I do? If I suddenly break, the, the carriages will tip over and thousands will die. So I just carry on. I don't break. I've never had an accident, thank God. Not one accident in a 30-year career. Nevertheless, danger is never far away on the train. For some, it's even exciting. Fearless street kids have even made it their playground. They call themselves the train kings. We have nothing else to do today. 
we fall around, being stupid. My parents don't want me to climb on top of the train, saying I should look for a job selling tea instead. But I don't want to. Up here, we're free. But we know that if we fall off, no one will look after us. That's just how it is. If I fall, the dogs will eat me next to the track. Yeah, you'll end up as dog food, all right. Black smoke is quite toxic. It's not good for your health. Despite the dangers and the smoke, I quite like traveling on the express. It's a good way to make the trip. The express is a good train. In Dhaka, Ghazi, the gold prospector, will finally find out how many grams of precious metal he's recovered from the bottom of the sewers. Blow! Hard! Of all the mud collected overnight, only a handful remains. Like an alchemist, Ghazi uses a powerful acid to extract the gold. You see, the acid will dissolve the other metals. <laughs> the fumes from the acid affect their lungs and attacks the skin and eyes, but they don't seem to realize it. <laughs> it's very bad for the lungs. It can give you asthma. To separate the gold from the mud, Ghazi uses mercury, a very toxic substance. The gold stuck to the mercury now. Heated to 400 degrees centigrade, the metal gives off toxic vapors, worse than acid. It attacks the workers' kidneys and brains. Once evaporated, what remains is a pure gold nugget. There's less than a gram here. It should fetch 15 euros. 15 euros, a paltry sum extracted from the bottom of the sewers of Dakar. At one time, I was living quite well off the gold. Now that's all in the past. It's getting worse, day by day. I should have stopped. I made the wrong choice, and it saddens me. The gold cycle is endless. The three men will sell the gold back to the shop from which it escaped. Here's the nugget. It's broken. I squashed it to, to make sure it was pure gold or not base metal. Wait. How much will you give me? 11 euros. I've made. 11 euros. We'll divide it between the three of us. 11 euros, four less than he'd hoped for. After a night down the sewers, Ghazi's workday is far from finished. When he returns to the room where he lives with his wife and three children, the tiny home becomes a workshop. 
We do this every night with my wife and children. We work until 11 at night. We make 400 of them for the equivalent of 2 euros 40. If my husband had been able to have a better education, he might have been able to open a grocery store or some kind of shop. That's why we sacrifice everything, to educate our children. My husband and I are uncultured, but I dream that nobody will be able to say the same of our children, and that they're never ashamed like we are. Many children don't go to school. I'm very lucky my parents send me. My dream is to become a businessman. I'll travel abroad and bring my parents with me. It's different in other countries. It's beautiful. There wasn't enough money for her sister to continue school. She now works with her parents to be able to pay for her younger brothers. Dakar is not far away now for the pilgrims. At every stop, the train is literally assaulted. The station master is overwhelmed. All those without tickets need to buy one as quickly as possible, either at the ticket office or from the inspectors. Controlling such large numbers is impossible, and the only practical measure is to prevent accidents. All those on the roof, please remain seated. Move up, there's still room. It's war. As soon as the train arrives, it's under attack. We'll fall off. Get out of the way. It's risky climbing up here, and you're pushing us to take our places. Move up. I'm here now, and I'm not moving. Well, climb down then if you're scared. Stop arguing. But he's taken my friend's place. Mm -hmm. There's too many people. It's packed. I'll try my luck elsewhere. Some know how to make hard cash from all this chaos. A few smart operators rent out their ladders. Twenty tackers to climb up. Hoi, you need to pay to climb up here. For six people, 30 tackers. Business isn't good. People try to sneak up. You, if you want to get up, it's 10 tackers. But you, you charge us money and there's no room. Give me my money back. Me too. The train is about to leave. And the police intervene. The cops are here. Let's go. Quick. Go away. No problem. It's all under control. You'd think it was chaos, but really, people are disciplined. Look around. Water, water. I'll try and go as far as I can, hanging on like this. 
We all have to die one day. I'll leave it up to Allah. Hang on! Oh, make some room for me, please. <laughs> Far from this confusion, there are those struggling to maintain an honorable life and stop their children ending up in the slums. This is the Sundarban in the south of the country where the river Ganges flows into the Gulf of Bengal. It's the largest mangrove forest in the world. At low tide, the silence is broken by some strange cries. They're made by these tame otters. They're not pets, but working animals. It's a lot easier to fish with them. They dive down to the roots, you see. They drive the fish into the nets. Go on, hunt. Using otters to fish goes back many centuries. Like his forefathers, Kumar trained his four animals himself. Go, hunt, dive. We live with them so we understand each other. You see, as soon as I move the stick, they dive. Go on, hunt. Go on. We taught them this language when they were tiny. The movements of our feet and our hands are a language that they understand now. I need to move a lot so that they work properly. But the nets draw in few fish. Every passing year, there are less fish in the waters of the mangrove. Pollution and overpopulation are the main causes. With 160 million inhabitants, Bangladesh is one of the world's most densely populated nations. In the old days, these waters were teeming with fish. These days, there are far less. It's because so many people live here now. They rely on fishing to feed themselves. Fishing is exhausting, yet Kumar pushes his men and animals to the limit. There are more fish at the end of low tide, and then it's a real race. Unfortunately for the fishermen, there's no miraculous catch. Come on, it's finished now. All the money we earn every month, we bring home. We buy rice, lentils, and everything we need. And we return here to make some more money, and so on and so forth. They know it's time to eat. That's why they're so upset. The voraciousness of the otters is a problem for the fishermen. The four of them devour between three and five kilos of fish a day. It's almost half the catch. 
Sometimes if we don't find enough fish, we need to buy some for the otters. If we don't feed them, they get weak and won't fish anymore. So we go to the market and buy fish. We lose money. It's okay? Can I light up the stove? Tonight, Kumar and his men will not eat as well as the otters. We're eight and we'll share two fish, and they're not big ones either. But that's all we caught. This tough, uncomfortable life is not one they think their children will want to follow. they're almost certainly the last otter fishermen of Bangladesh. The horn blasts finally announce the arrival in Dakar. A relief for some, agony for others. You have to block your ears the whole time. These foghorns can make you deaf. Some pilgrims spent all eight hours of the journey standing. Others squeezed on top of others. Even the lucky ones, such as Safik and Doha, are at the end of their tether. I'm exhausted, very tired. But I'm happy, because we're close to Dakar. This hard journey will soon be over. I'm so happy. God be praised. We'll walk in the footsteps of Allah. Get the baggage. Hurry up. The hardest thing now for the Imam is not to lose his congregation in the crowds. Go that way and follow the crowds. A tide of humanity, millions of people converge on the prayer sites. Safiq and his group will camp out and pray and meditate for three days. The location is not a holy Islamic site, but every year scholars from around the world come to spread the good word. For the six million Muslim faithful, following these teachings gives a sense to their lives. In Bangladesh, a life often made up of sacrifice.